and welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Joseph and I empower people with tools to strengthen relationships and ease hassles and make parenting and communication easier. Um, this week in our Parenting Through Difficult Times series for the, the School District 46 on the Sunshine Coast, we're talking about understanding adolescent brain. Um, and I'm really excited about this topic because talking about brains is one of my favorite things to do. Um, so let's jump right in, shall we? So as I said, talking about brains is one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> and so much so that I actually wrote a children's book called The Animals in My Brain, um, which I found, you know, I, I did this because I was constantly um, talking to kids and teens about their brains and trying to explain to parents what was happening in a, a child's brains or in a teen's brain. And um, I came up, I started using this analogy and developed this poster that I'm sharing with you now on your screen. Um, and then <clears throat> it turned it into a book. Um, and it, it's, it's done quite well. Um, and I've gotten so much positive feedback about it, which has been lovely. Um, and I know it's a, a picture book <laughs> for children. Uh, however, it is such a good way to talk about the brain and understand the brain that I do use this poster still when I'm, when I'm working with teens. Um, and often when I'm working with adults, because it just gives us an easy way to talk about the brain. So I thought that I would share it with you tonight and you can do with it what you may. You can download a copy if you'd like a copy of this um, poster for free from my website, sarahjoseph.ca. Um, or, you know, feel free to use just the scientific terms. <laughs> That's your jam. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I'm going to start by talking about the amygdala. So the amygdala is the part of the brain that I like to call the guard dog. And our guard dog is, you know, he's set up to really warn us about danger and help us act fast without thinking. Um, you know, um, and this is part of our brain that's super helpful in times when we're in danger or there's, um, we need to respond quickly to something. However, it's not so great on every day. Um, annoyances or whatever. So basically the guard dog's job is to take in everything that's going on around us, all the sights, the sounds, the, the smells, and decide if that information is safe or unsafe. Now, if it decides that it's safe, what it's going to do is let that information go up to the higher um, areas of the brain for processing. And so these parts of the brain are the hippocampus, or what I like to refer to as the elephant of the brain because elephants have good memories, right? Um, so the hippocampus is the part of our brain that's going to help us learn and remember and recall. So we definitely need, need the hippocampus um, to be working at its full capacity when we're in school or when we're trying to um, write a test or an exam. Um, it also helps us remember rules and people's names and all that kind of stuff. The, the prefrontal cortex is the other part of the brain that information will go into to be coded and to be utilized. And that is what I like to refer to as the wise old owl of our brain. The prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that we use for problem solving, for making plans. It's the part of our brain that's in control of language, reasoning, logic, and impulse control. Okay. So when the guard dog, has, thinks that the information around us feels safe, feels like the information that, that it's taking in and receiving, feels like the emotional stability of us, um, the information, the emotional thermostat inside of us is, is good. Our guard dog is nice and relaxed and lets that information flow throughout our brain and our brain works, uh, those animals work together. Um, all three of them work together quite nicely. When our guard dog um, feels like something isn't safe, so now that could be an outside thing. For instance, 
we just got into a car accident. It could be an outside of our bodies thing, but you know, it's just a person in our, in our environment who's making a lot of noise while we're trying to study and that's really annoying. Um, or it could be us feeling frustrated or sad, overwhelmed. All of those things can trigger our guard dog into thinking that we are in danger. And whether we're in a car accident or we're just feeling rejected or <laughs> upset that uh, mom and dad won't lend me the car, uh, the guard dog responds in the exact same way, okay? So he helps shut down the elephant and the wise old owl um, to help us act fast without thinking. So when the guard dog starts barking, the elephant and the wise old owl hide and we don't have access to them. Anthony the ape comes out. He's our fight, flight, or freeze response. And when he's in control, when he's the one in control of the brain, we often say and do things that we wouldn't normally say or do. And we often, as kids, kids often get into trouble when they have Anthony in charge. Um, when this happens, whether you are a child, an adolescent, or an adult, when this happens, you often say and do things that you wouldn't normally say and do when you have your rational mind intact. Um, that's where the saying came from, he flipped his lid or he went ape. Um, because because we're, we're, not, we're acting like cavemen, we're acting like we don't have our full capacity. Um, and, and, that, and that's very true, we don't. We don't have access to the part of our brain that's in, that's in control of impulse control that's in control of reasoning and logic and language, which is why sometimes when you get upset and you get into a fight with somebody, you can't really find the words um, to finish sentences or to explain yourself well. Um, it's why you can't reason with a teenager sometimes <laughs> when they're really upset. <laughs> it's why sometimes teenagers seem impulsive, right? Um, now, <clears throat> the problem with this system, because it works really well <laughs> for, for some things, but the, the main problem with this system is that the guard dog doesn't know the difference between what's really dangerous and what's just our, our feelings um, or somebody annoying us from the outside pushing our buttons, right? And so we often flip into that fight, flight, or freeze response when we don't really need it. Um, the other issue with this is that um, for adolescent brains, the prefrontal cortex is still not mature. Now, they, you know, we think that they have a more mature brain than, you know, uh, an elementary school child does. Um, <clears throat> but their, their brains are still developing and won't be fully developed until well into their 20s. So what, what happens is as the brain is developing, it's not developing all at the same speed. So our, the amygdala is actually developing faster um, than the prefrontal cortex, which means that often what happens for a teenage brain is that the context of the situation is really important. If it has an emotional aspect to the situation, then there's a good chance that the amygdala is going to take over reasoning and logic, okay? If the situation doesn't have an emotional charge to it, then there's a good chance that the prefrontal cortex is going to be working okay. Does that make sense? I hope that that clarifies or makes it clear that when adolescents feel emotionally charged, in a context, in, in any kind of situation, if there's like, if they feel emotionally charged in that situation, then the amygdala is running the show, okay? Um, when that happens, when the amygdala or the ape is, or are running the show, so when the guard dog or the ape is running the show, there's really nothing we can do that's going to get through to them. <laughs> Okay, you can't reason with somebody who's, whose wise old owl has flown away. It just doesn't work. Um, so basically, don't waste your breath. Um, 
So what I, what I like to say is that there is no point in trying to correct behavior. There's no point in trying to reason or logic. There's no point in trying to um, punish or um, solve problems. Really, the only thing we can do in this situation is help the, the person calm down and get their wise old owl back on their perch, and then we can go into the problem solving, okay, or the correcting the behavior, um, <clears throat> or whatever it is, the lecturing, or, <laughs> you know, trying to make sense of the situation. But until, <laughs> until the person is calm, we can't, we can't do any of that. Um, so, so it's really important that we recognize that, that the amygdala is, is going to be in control a lot of the time, uh, with adolescents that they have, you know, kind of, a, uh, they easily flip into that portion of their brain. Um, and when we know that what we can do is we can watch for cues that that's happening. Okay. Um, and we can talk to our, 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 our teens about that and ask them, how, what does it feel like when you're in that part of your brain, when that part of your brain is taking over? And so the way that I like to phrase this is, what does it feel like when your guard dog is growling or barking? Because our body really does send us messages about what is going on, right? Our body knows before our brain figures it out. So our body will send us sensations, sig signals that might feel like our, our throat is tightening or our, you know, our muscles are tensing or we might flush with, with a red hot face or have butterflies in our stomach or our breathing might feel more shallow or difficult. Our heart might be going fast. Right? Those are all great body signals that we can pay attention to that might help us recognize that we're moving into our amygdala brain and maybe out of our, our prefrontal cortex. Um, and when we recognize that, what we can do is take a break and, and help soothe our guard dog so that we can get back our wise old owl on its perch to help us think rationally. Okay, so there are some brain differences. Um, everybody's guard dog is different, just like everybody's brain is different and personalities are different. Um, sometimes uh, the amygdala grows at a different rate than, um, than other people's amygdala, and that can be caused from trauma or anxiety, um, sometimes from cognitive delays or mental health disorders such as ADHD. They can all account for brain differences and sometimes brain differences impact our ability to self-regulate. So the amygdala is impacted by the, the way that it's developed and the experiences it's had. Um, and often if, <clears throat> if it's, it's kind of like a muscle. So, you know, if it's been used a lot, <laughs> then it, it, ha it happens to overdevelop, okay? And the overdevelopedness of it makes it just more sensitive. So, you know, I like to think, this, think of this in terms of actual dogs, right? You might have a very calm to relaxed dog at your home who, uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't bark at birds flying out the windows or squirrels running by or a postman coming to drop off a package at your door um, that might not alert your dog at all, right? Where my dog um, was a rescue dog and she's very alert and hypersensitive to noises around our home. So a truck coming up our street and she's at the door barking. Um, if somebody's walking up our driveway, she's on it, she's barking. Um, <clears throat> you know, just... <laughs> Uh, just the slightest banging or like a radio in a different part of the house and she's on it. She's barking. <laughs> so um, that, and that, you know, I think that's a good analogy for us to think about of just how some people's guard dogs are very relaxed and calm um, and are able to get from um, alert state to calm very quickly. And other people's guard dogs are way more alert and on it 
um, in terms of, of seeing risks everywhere and barking more readily um, and not feeling as safe, okay? Um, so one of the resources that I wanted to mention tonight is, is um, this book by Dan Siegel. He is a best-selling author. He is a neurobiologist and a parent, and he writes amazing parenting books. This is a great guide um, for adolescents and parents to read together or separately. Um, the book is, is really insightful and is, is written in a way that, that adolescents could read it um, and take information about what's happening in their brain and be able to apply some tools that he offers. Um, it's also great for parents to read because it just gives you an understanding of what's really happening and kind of changes the way we think about um, teenagers and what, what's happening for them. In his book, he, show, he talks about the research um, that's been done recently, more recently, <laughs> that shows that an adolescent's brain is really under construction. They're moving into this phase where changes are occurring, um, occurring in the brain. Um, and these changes are really important developmental changes that really help um, new abilities to emerge. Um, and it's, you know, it's an exciting time. I think that um, I like the way that he talks about teens and what's happening for them, because so often we hear of the teen years as, you know, with all these myths, arranging hormones and teens that are irrational and making poor decisions and taking unnecessary risks and just having no self-control. And Dan kind of flips the script on this <laughs> talks about how necessary um, this phase is and how amazing the teenage brain is for its creativity and innovation. It's probably one of the most innovative times of our lives when we're in our, in our adolescence. Um, how it's the teenage brain is developing this new capacity for abstract thinking um, and how this, you know, we, you know, we often talk about taking unnecessary risks, but really what's happening is the brain is driving teens to experiment, right? To try new things, to figure things out, to take these risks and um, step out of their comfort zones. Um, yeah, I really, I really like how he's flipped the script on, on this and really helps us put facts <laughs> in the place of myths with his brain science and um, his research. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that he talks about is how when we're, when we're growing, right, during elementary school, we are really le learning in this big picture kind of way. Um, as you can see over here on this picture, we're, we're learning about how the world works and we're making all these connections about these things. And what happens in this phase of brain development is that the brain starts pruning away some of the information that has been collected that is no longer being used or not needed. So when it's doing this, what's happening for teens is they're moving from this big picture of how the world works and what's going on in the world to a more specific picture of these are the things I like and these are the things I want to do. Um, and helping them find their passion and helping to um, get more specific information about those things. So there's, you know, there's the brain kind of has a, a use it or lose it um, mentality. So if there are things that, that adolescents like to do, um, that they should keep doing them so that they don't lose that information. So if they're into sports or dance or music, then the teenage years is a really important time to continue practicing those things so that those skills develop and we don't, we don't lose the information that we had already learned about those, those passions or those, um, those subjects. The other thing that's happening to the brain as it's under construction during the, the uh, um, adolescent years is this myelin 
formation. And so what myelin is, is just this healthy sheath that um, is over the brain and it connects neurons. And when it does this, what happens is we just have more effective, faster communication between neurons. So it's a really great thing um, that's happening for adolescent brains. It just helps them think more quickly on the spot um, and helps everything work in a more efficient way. So one of the things that I wanted to share about was, I thought was timely, is that our window of tolerance. And our window of tolerance is really this, this, this zone of optimum functioning. And when we're in our zone of optimum functioning, we can learn best and we can function best. <laughs> we can respond to stress best. Um, it's just where we can show up as our best selves, really. And it's where growth happens. And so for, for teens, it's, you know, it's helpful if we're able to help them stay in that zone. Um, and you can see when you go to either side of the rainbow, if you get too far outside of your optimal functioning zone, what happens is that we move into signs of distress and then we have pretty much like complete breakdowns, right? Um, so the key here is to try to find, trying to figure out where our optimal functioning range is and to stay within that. Um, and to recognize signs of when we're moving outside of it. The window of tolerance, often we talk about it closing. Um, and I, I like this idea of the rainbow shrinking, right? So <laughs> if you stay with me here. Um, our window of tolerance is based, what I, how I like to think about it is this, like the straw on a camel's back. So how much straw can your camel carry? right? Like what's the, the, the straw that's going to break the camel's back? Basically, every bit of straw that goes on that camel is shrinking our, our rainbow or closing our window of tolerance and making it more challenging for us to deal with stress. So if you think about the average day, right, you might wake up with your window of tolerance being quite large. Um, and as the day progresses, more and more stress happens and more and more things happen, uh, more and more straw is placed on the camel's back, and that is closing the window of optimal functioning, right? If we're, you know, I, I always like to think about it as, you know, you wake up in the morning and you, you know, you had a decent night's sleep, but your alarm didn't go off, so you're running late. And then you're trying to get yourself and everybody else out the door so we can all be on time to school and, and work. Um, but, you know, nobody's cooperating with you. So, you know, a little more straw on the, on the camel's back. Um, and then finally get everybody into the car, but you can't find your car keys. And then you're on the highway and you're, you get stuck behind somebody who's doing, you know, 40 in an 80 zone. Um, that's never happened to you before on the coast, has it? <laughs> so more, more straw on the camel's back. And then you get everybody off to school and you finally get to work and you're walking in the door and you spill your coffee on your white shirt right before you walk into that important meeting. Um, and so again, the, it's all straw on the camel's back, right? And because you have this optimal functioning range, because you have coping skills, um, you can deal with this, these hassles, this stress, right? So your window is closing, you're feeling frustrated, you're feeling annoyed, but you're able to maintain your composure, right? Um, for the most part and not have a complete meltdown. However, as the day goes on, things continue to be just as awful. It's a pretty terrible, awful day with lots of craziness happening things coming your way. And so the, the pile of hay grows taller and higher. And at the end of the day, you walk into your house and you immediately trip over somebody's shoes who didn't put those shoes on the shoe rack where they're supposed to go. And you absolutely lose your mind. You totally move into that fight, flight, or freeze response. 
and start yelling at everybody. And your family looks at you like you're crazy because, well, there's always shoes at the front door <laughs> and you often trip over them, but you don't often have a meltdown about it, right? So for your family, it looks like this one little thing that's happened that's made you have a complete meltdown, where in reality, you've been carrying this load all day and your window of tolerance was shrinking all day. And this was just the straw that broke the camel's back, right? So <clears throat> as you can see, sometimes what happens is people don't have a good night's sleep and they wake up on the wrong side of the bed and their window of tolerance is just smaller already before the day has even gotten started, right? Um, for teen and adolescents, you know, we can imagine that their window is shrinking a bit just simply because their amygdala is on alert, is, has heightened activity during the teen years. Um, but also, like, I think it's important to recognize that right now during a global pandemic, the window, everybody's window of tolerance is going to be a bit smaller, okay? Um, that in that optimal arousal zone, that optimal functioning zone, that's where people can learn and cope and manage with their emotions. Once that optimal functioning zone closes, um, it's really not helpful to pressure people to stay engaged in a conversation or a conflict because they've moved outside of their capacity to function at that point, to be rational, to be reasonable, to solve problems. Instead, it's really helpful to take a break and then re-engage, talk to the person after they've had time to regulate themselves and their emotions. As I was saying, it's really normal right now for all of us to have a smaller window of tolerance. Um, and that's normal during any type of stressful time or ch big changes in our lives. So, um, you know, the global pandemic is definitely a big challenge and a big, a big change. Um, going back to school is a big change, right? Or having to, to learn how to do distance learning, that's a big change. And so if you are seeing your, your teen acting out more, having more blow, blowouts, meltdowns, whatever you want to call them, um, or shutting down more often, that's normal. It's normal. It's to be expected. Um, if they're having trouble learning, listening, staying focused, normal right now, okay? Um, if you find that yourself, you have less patience, you find that you're getting more annoyed or feeling more triggered more quickly uh, by things that your, your family is, are doing, all normal, <laughs> okay? One of the things that we can do to help ourselves and to help our teens is talk about this and let everybody know that that's normal, right? When we can normalize it, we can talk about it in ways where we can help each other and we can have more compassion for each other. Um, and we can recognize what's happening, right? That it's about our brains and how our brains are functioning and not about us. It's not that you're weak. It's not that you can't deal with this. It's not that you're not strong enough to get through this time. It's simply that our brains have less capacity for stress, okay? So when we can explain it in that way, we can really help ourselves and help our families um, to be able to support each other through this and recognize when we need, we need a break um, and when, when to come back, <laughs> we're more calm to talk about things. Um, and also we just to have that common language, right? I really encourage you to either sit down and watch this over with your teen or to watch some of Dan Siegel's videos. He's got a, an amazing YouTube channel and website um, that talks about brains. It's just, you know, once, once we, information, is, knowledge is power, right? And so, and language is so important. And when we have a shared language and a shared understanding of what's happening, um, it just makes life so much easier. 
So that's, that's what I encourage you to do. Find a time to sit down with your teen and watch, watch a video about the brain. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I thought that it was really important tonight to just to talk about what's happening in the teenage brain. So we have a little bit better understanding of what's going on and to put it into context of, of the pandemic. So there was one more screen that I wanted to share with you. And that's, can you see that? This, this is, I'm, I'm hoping that you're seeing what I'm seeing, which is um, the teen social distancing COVID-19 um, iceberg, what, teen, what parents may be seeing and hearing, um, and what teens may be experiencing. So above the iceberg, what we might be seeing and hearing from our teens is this excessive screen time or a lot of compl complaining and defiance. Um, it might be showing up as disrespect or ignoring, refusing, fighting, leaving, sneaking, right? But what teens might be experiencing below the surface is worry and boredom. They might be feeling helpless um, or disconnected disconnected emotionally. They might be feeling dysregulated, like their brain um, emotionally dysregulated, uh, like that amygdala or the guard dog is taking over their brain. There might be a lot of fear and confusion, um, misunderstand misunderstanding, and worrying about social status. So <clears throat> when we're thinking about how to deal with these things, um, it's important that we don't focus on the tip of the iceberg. Um, but that we address what's under the surface, right? And again, when, we, when we're able to create that shared language and share information about the brain and what's happening for us, um, what we're feeling, and just kind of normalize some of the, the struggles and challenges that living during a, a global pandemic, trying to go to high school. Can you imagine? High school is hard enough, <laughs> let alone throwing in a global pandemic into the mix. Um, if when we're able to, to just empathize and validate feelings and have those conversations, um, you know, it just, it makes it a lot more comfortable for everybody. And um, it really helps connect us and often reduces the outbursts or the the it reduces the the fighting because we can recognize what's happening and we can de-escalate things more quickly okay so that's the goal is to understand what's happening then to be able to recognize what's happening and then to be able to help co-regulate and de-escalate things before they get too far gone. So when we go into that fight, flight, or freeze response, it is a physiological reaction that, that throws our whole system off balance. And it takes, for an adult, it takes a good 20 minutes for a physiological reaction to go back to our balance of homeostasis. So for us to think, about, I, I like to think about it like this, when the guard dog and the ape are in control and the other two animals, the owl and the, the elephant are gone, it takes at least 20 minutes for an adult to get the wise old owl and their elephant back where they need to be in order to learn, in order to problem solve. Okay. For adolescents and children, it takes longer because their brains aren't developed yet, right? So where as an adult, you may be able to pull in some of the, you might be able to access some of the prefrontal cortex and some of the hippocampus during a meltdown. Um, and when I say meltdown, I just mean we feel emotionally overwhelmed, okay? <laughs> so during that emotional overwhelm flooding of our system, um, because we're moving into our fight or flight, we may be able to access bits and pieces of that part of our brain. But for um, teens and children, that's not the case. And it takes a lot longer for them to get those parts of the brain back online. Um, 
sometimes up to an hour or more. So it's, it's a really amazing skill when we can learn how to recognize when we're starting to get elevated, um, when our guard dogs are starting to bark or growl, so that then we can stop that process in its tracks and not go into that full meltdown stage and take such a long time to get back into a place where we're ready to learn or ready to problem solve or communicate clearly. Um, so it can save us a lot of time and pain and energy <laughs> when we're able to uh, recognize that coming on. So some of the ways that we can help our teens and ourselves open our window of tolerance, kind of put down some of the hay that we've been carrying around, the straw that's gonna break the camel's back, put some of that down, open up the window, um, stay, keep our animals where we need them, um, is connection. Connection is one of the best ways I know for helping everybody feel safe and feel um, like they can handle stress, like they're not alone. Um, so finding time to connect as a family, finding time to connect one-on-one. -on -one. Um, the other ways is like self-care. So sleeping, eating regularly, <laughs> eating well, um, exercise, right? Connecting with nature and doing things that, that, that they love, doing things that make them feel good. So that might be connecting with friends. It might be playing an instrument or listening to music. Um, it might be dancing or playing a sport. All of those things are excellent ways to release some of the heavy load and help open the window of tolerance. The other ways, um, you know, more scientific ways or <laughs> clinical ways would be learning mindfulness tools. Um, so meditation, uh, breathing techniques, um, those types of things. Often what I suggest um, for, for kids that I work with or adults that I work with is creating a, a, a short list of things that you can do when you're moving in, when you feel like your guard dog is barking. Um, when, you're, when it's growling and you're moving into that, that area um, is what are the things that make you feel better? and making a short list and putting it somewhere that is obvious on the fridge or on your bedroom door or something where you can just look at it and pick one of the things on that list to try to see if it can help you feel better in that moment. Um, and again, sometimes it, 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 the list is things like put music on, <laughs> right? Listen to this song or play this playlist. Um, sometimes it says go for a walk or cuddle with the dog, right? Um, and, and that's it. It's not, it doesn't have to be complicated. It just means that we're taking a break and we're doing something that's going to help us feel more grounded, um, emotionally supported, and maybe take a little bit of the weight off. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to wrap up now. Um, and turn off the recording so that the people who have joined live can have a discussion about this. And next week, I can't remember what I'm talking about. One moment, I'll check the schedule for you. Next week, <laughs> we are talking about connecting and letting go, which is, a, I'm so smart how I set this up. <laughs> As I said, connecting is such an important aspect of um, brain health and helping manage emotions. And teens really do need space to experiment and try things out on their own and make mistakes. And so next week we're talking about letting go as well. All right, so I'm gonna turn off the recording now. So for those of you who are watching the replay, thank you so much for joining us and hopefully you can join us live for a, a good discussion next week. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.